They said, as you picked up, um, this is our fourth Sunday of Advent. It's Sunday, or say fourth, I don't know where my mind's at, second Sunday. Um, Christmas Eve is tomorrow. No. Um, but we're looking at joy today. And there's lots of things that we could look and consider in, in looking at joy and thinking about it. Um, but as the, as the video showed, joy is, is more than a feeling. If you look to the Greek or the Hebrew, you find that words like happiness are the same as joy. However, in our contemporary language, they send, tend, tend to have a different subtle um, meaning. And it's important for us to stop and see how joy is more than just a feeling. A definition that I came across, or our summary here, that we want to look at today is the good news of great joy for all people and how this is shocking news that we dare not get used to. You see, this idea of great joy as we just sang about is, is something that we know the words to. But what we want to th consider today is how it is shocking news that we dare not get used to. As I thought about it, I wondered, well, what's the difference? And I realized that joy is, is a possession that's received from others or from circumstances. You can't make yourself joyful, right? It's a response to circumstances that are surrounding you. And if we look in our dictionary, we find the top synonyms for joy are happiness, delight, and pleasure. And these are all good definitions. We define words according to how we use them, and this indeed is how we might use it. But, but if I tell you that we're talking about joy today, a good question for you to ask me is, well, what kind of joy? Because you know that there are different types of joy things, things that make you joyful out there in the world. The joy of Christmas is more than just a feeling. It's something that we have because of what Christ has done. It's something more than what we feel from receiving a present or the pleasure that we have in celebrating the meal together. One author defined Christian joy this way, saying, Christian joy is a good feeling in the soul, produced by the Holy Spirit as he causes us to see the beauty of Christ in the world in the word and in the world. I think that helps us. It's helped us to see what this joy is. It helps us see that the joy that we're talking about today is what we might call Christian joy. It's not joy in the pleasures of this life, but it's joy that we find in Christ. And this Christian joy lifts up our soul. It's not just because of a change in circumstances but it lifts up our soul. So I, thought I try to think of a good example. I bet if any of you were to play, you know, go up and visit Patty in, in uh, Franklin and get the lottery ticket and won the lottery and won a million, two million, whatever it is, that there would be a certain element of joy, right? I mean, we know that. But we also know that that's not a lasting joy because as easily as that money may come, circumstances in life can take it away. And the joy that we want to talk about, think about here, is different than that joy because our joy is an everlasting joy, a joy that can't be taken away. It never can be used up or run out or lost or stolen. You see, it is a joy that is rooted in a sure hope, not in changing circumstances. Yes, it brings good feelings. I mean, that's part of this definition of joy. It, it brings those good feelings, but the good feelings are what we have in our soul, not just in the day. It's not an idea. It's not a conviction. It's not a persuasion. It's not a decision. It's a feeling. It's an emotion that is real, more real than all the other feelings that we have. That's a joy that we want to consider today. And so as we look to joy, you may say, that's great. But why are we looking to the story of Mary? You know, if you were gonna, in a moment, I'm going to read the whole passage that we're looking at today. And you'll notice that joy isn't even mentioned until the very end. And so the question is, why are we looking at this? 
And I hope that at the end, we'll have an answer. Let me read for us Luke 1, 26 through 44. You can follow along in your Bible or up here on the screen. Familiar story. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled by the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. <clears throat> and this is a sixth month with her who was called barren. For nothing is impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. In those days, Mary rose and went with haste into the hill country uh, to the town of Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and she exclaimed in a loud voice blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb and why is this and, and why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me for behold when the sound of your greeting came to my ears the baby in my womb leaped for joy well what is our Theme. What are we looking at? Again, it said, the good news of great joy for all people is shocking news that we dare not get used to. I don't know about you, but I've heard this story before. I bet you have as well. And unfortunately, that familiarity oftentimes doesn't mean or ceases to mean that this story is shocking. But this is a shocking story. The events that are spoken of here are things that we should not get used to because when we get used to them we fail to see the splendor the amazingness of these words and when we fail to see how amazing these words are then we'll miss the joy that is found in them as well it's likely that you're here today because you already have a belief in God or you are wanting to Find that belief. You want to know more about who he is. And we all come with a different background. Some of you have no background at all in church, hearing these stories. Maybe you've heard them before, but you really haven't thought about them. And so you're wondering, what do these stories mean? Maybe you came here in your background. You have a tradition of going to church, but the churches you went to never really talked much about Jesus, about his birth about who he is, being our Savior. Or maybe you come with all that in mind, but still desire to know more. Whatever it is that we're coming from, it is here that I hope that we find some fresh information, a fresh encounter of who Jesus is. And so when we look to the story, we begin to see how it unfolds, and these are important parts for us to understand the joy that is experienced here at the end. For it isn't until the end of the story when Mary visits Elizabeth that we see both Mary, Elizabeth, and Elizabeth's baby all have an expression of joy. This is a foundation. This, this story here in these introductory verses of how Gabriel speaks to Mary lay the foundation for the joy that will be threaded throughout the story 
We could look to the other Gospels and see some similar ideas, but, but I think here is a good place for us to start. Remember our synonyms for joy, happiness, delight, pleasure? Again, as I said already, if our definition of joy is just happiness, the way we typically define that word, I think we'll find ourselves left empty. In a moment, we'll look at these words and we begin to see that there is nothing in these words to make Mary happy. Um, Think about that as we work our way towards that. But there's something different here. There's something that is beyond circumstances that define happiness for us. I hope you understand my illustration, but, but the difference between how we use happiness and joy is important. If I told you that I was happy to hear about the death of a loved one, you would say, well, what's wrong with you? I mean, that's not a word we associate with death, is it? But if I say to you that I have joy in hearing about this, I have joy because of what that means for the person, that makes sense. You see, we, we inherently know the difference between joy and happiness. And it's helpful for us to see how the Christian joy is something greater. Again, Christian joy is a good feeling in the soul, produced by the Holy Spirit as he causes us to see the beauty of Christ in the Word and in the world. There's joy in this life. There's joy and peace even in death because of what Christ has brought us. It's because of what Christ has done for us that we're able to know this joy. Again, remember, joy is not limited by circumstances. And it's because of that <clears throat> that we can say amen to James's words in James 1, 3, or 2 through 4. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that your faith, when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is developed fully, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. You see, Mary understood this. She understands, as as Gabriel speaks to her, of the hope and the joy that, that this message will bring. But as I said, we don't initially see it here, do we? For there's nothing joyful for Mary and her circumstances in these words on the surface. Mary's not a prophet. She's not a priest. She wasn't like Zacharias serving in the temple when the angel of the Lord spoke to her. She's simply a young woman living at home with her parents, preparing for marriage that is yet to come. Let's go back to our reading here in Luke chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. There's two important details here that we want to just make a quick note of. The first is the thing that we all know about Mary. She was a virgin that was betrothed to a man named Joseph. The second one is this relationship with him, and we find it's her as well, to the house of David. Let's look at those. First, the virgin was betrothed. Now, I don't know what your translation says, but many of our translations, in in an attempt to make it more understandable, they will use other words than betrothed here. Yours might say engaged. Unfortunately, that's an unfortunate translation um, because it's betrothal and engagement in the Hebrew culture of the day were quite different. And if you don't know, I wanted just to briefly summarize what betrothal might mean. In the Jewish society, the parents of the betrothed generally drew up a marriage contract, one family with another, for their son and for their daughter. And... And what was interesting is that the bride and groom would 
perhaps meet for the first time when this was done. It was greater than what we talk about in, in an engagement. Because after this was done, after the contract was signed, they would be considered as being married, as we might consider it. But they would live separately for a period of time. This period of time would last maybe a year or so. It would allow the husband to prepare a home for them to move into. Um, and would allow a period of time for the wife's, the woman's purity to be made clear. In other words, if she became pregnant during that time, then, well, it would be a problem. But it would be more than we might imagine. Because it would be seen as being an adulterous thing because she is already pledged, she's already betrothed, she in a sense is already married. That's why this news that the angel tells her is so troubling. And we'll get to that as well in a moment. At the end of this time, at the end of the betrothal period, the groom was come for his bride. It wasn't necessarily at an expected time. He would just come and the time for the party, the celebration, the marriage feast would all begin. The angel's announcement to Mary would bring both public humiliation, shame, and could even mean the penalties of adultery. The second thing is also interesting here that we oftentimes don't stop and think about. Or, if you're like me, you don't think about fully. And that's this idea that both Mary and Joseph were from the house of David. But what's interesting, if you've read through the New Testament and the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, you find two different genealogies. And you may say, well, why are they different? Well, it's obvious. One traces the genealogy through Mary and the other one through Joseph. <laughs> Now, you might not think much about that, or maybe you thought lightly about it, but, but the question is, well, why is there a difference? And especially, why is Matthew's in looking at Joseph? As I was reading about that, I came across an interesting observation concerning that. For what we learn about Matthew's genealogy, looking at, at Mary, is that the bottom line is, if, if the descendants from uh, of Jesus just came through Joseph, then he couldn't assume the role of the Messiah. He couldn't become king. In fact, if we look on in the text, we find that he was disqualified because of his lineage. Why is that? Well, because a Messiah couldn't come as a descendant of David through Solomon, or in this case, as a descendant of Jeconiah. In Jeremiah, we find the curse is pronounced upon him. Jeremiah 22, 18, and then also 30. Uh, this is one of, of uh, through Joseph's line. Therefore, this is what the Lord says about Jeconiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah. This is what the Lord says. Record this man as if childless, a man who will not prosper in his lifetime, for none of his offspring will prosper. None will sit on the throne of David or rule anymore in Judah. Well, why is that important? You see, if we look to just Joseph's line, which the world at that day would have, he couldn't descend from that line. He would be disqualified. And so the thought is that the reason that we have that is not to point out this problem, but to highlight what Matthew goes on to also say of the importance of the virgin birth. You see, if he was a child of Joseph, he couldn't be the Messiah. But because he was conceived through the Holy Spirit, through Mary, who was also a descendant of Joseph or of David, and didn't descend through through Solomon, but through Nathan, then he could ascend to the throne. Now, it's unlikely that Joseph or Mary knew of this. Maybe they did. I don't know. But, but it's why do we have these things here? See, it emphasizes the point and the necessity of the virgin birth for Jesus to be the Messiah. Well, as we read on, we find four things that the angel tells Mary. 
Listen again of how these things reveal the good news of great joy for all people and how it is shocking and how we dare not get used to it. Luke 1, 28 through 33. And Gabriel came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled, by, uh, troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will be no end. There's four things here. The first one is a address, O favored one. O favored one. Again, you've heard it before. Maybe we've even sung a song with that in it. But if we pause to think about why this would be troubling, why it would be confusing for Mary. In fact, we know that it was troubling because Luke tells us that it was troubling. The angel knows that these words were troubling. Now, we also know that whenever the angels speak, people are oftentimes troubled, aren't they? Zechariah wondered. He was terrified by what the angel had appeared to him. But Mary was also troubled because this isn't normal. Why would he speak to me, a young woman? In a manner of such words, why would he call me the favored one? Why would this heavenly visitor greet me in such a way? Well, of course, the answer comes in the next part. The next part is the reason for the visit, to tell her that you will conceive and bear a son. There's many reasons, as I said, why this would be troubling. Mary understood what this would mean. What would mean if she was found to be pregnant before her betrothal was finalized? And so it causes her in verse 34 to ask a simple but obvious question. And Mary said to the angel, how will this be since I'm a virgin? How will this be? How indeed? It's interesting the answer that Gabriel gives her. He gives her news, yet it seems that she's likely not even to know yet. Verses 36 and 37 and behold, your relative Elizabeth is, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. For what? For nothing is impossible with God. You see, the answer to the question of how can this be is simply that nothing is impossible with God. Nothing. You see, just as the Lord announced to Zechariah about Elizabeth's conception, the angel announces what God was about to do through Mary, the one who was highly favored, the one who would give birth to God's son, Jesus. That's the third thing. You shall call his name Jesus. Listen to verses 31 and 35. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child will be called the Son of God. What did we say about this news release? The good news of great joy for all people is shocking news that we dare not get used to. This is shocking news. Maybe not to us because we're familiar with the story, but we go back and to see this is mind-boggling. Nothing could be more shocking than this. I mean, it's one thing to hear that a virgin was going to give birth, that she was going to become pregnant. It's quite another to hear that he was going to be the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. One of the things that we find here as well, as we analyze the text, is the implication of this news. For it's in verses like this one that we see that this child will be fully God and fully man. 
He's fully God because it's Mary's child. He's fully, I'm sorry, fully man because he's Mary's child and fully God because he was conceived through the Holy Spirit. Thomas Aquinas makes this observation about this. He says, in order that the body of Christ might be shown to be a real body, one physical, he was born of a woman. But in order that his Godhead might be made clear, he was born of a virgin. Both are necessary. But there's one more thing that we're told here by the angel. We're also told that he will be given the throne of David, verses 32 and 33. He will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign in the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. I mean, these are mind-boggling things. The child that was to be born to Mary was going to be king. He was going to inherit David's throne. He's a promised Messiah. He's going to reign, but not just for the normal period, but he is going to reign forever. If we are going to interpret literally what Gabriel said in verses 30 and 31, we must also interpret literally what he says here in 32 and 33. He's referring to the covenant that was made with David about his kingdom and the promises to the people of Israel. That Jesus was coming to earth to be the Savior, but he was also fulfilling this promise made to the Jewish forefathers. This reign is pointing to a time in the future when Jesus would come and reign forever. All these promises are going to be fulfilled through this baby that is going to be born to Mary. How can this be? I mean, that question should ring in our ears because this is shocking news. Yes, it's good news, but, but we can't comprehend it. How indeed is this possible? You see, these words are so improbable that any rational person is going to write them off as a bad dream. But Mary doesn't. And I think that's one of the reasons, we have other reasons, but that's one of the reasons why the Lord chose to use Mary, because she was a woman of faith. You see, the Lord knew Mary, her willingness to to be used to do the impossible. And as we think about it, I can ask you to do something difficult. And you may say, that's overwhelming. Now, but you may think, well, I need to say yes anyway, right? But it's a reluctant yes. And when I read this text, sometimes I read in my own projection of reluctancy. But I wonder if it's really there. You see, I think sometimes it's likely to be my reluctancy to be used in ways that I can't imagine that I force onto Mary. But I think what we find, especially as the story progresses, that there's no tone of reluctancy, but simply a tone of rejoicing, a joyful tone. Verse 38, I am the Lord's slave, said Mary. May it be done to me according to your word. And then the angel left. Now, why would we say that that could be joyful, not just simply reluctant? Well, I think as we work our way down through the passage and the verses that follow, we begin to see this. For her questions are put aside, and she embraces what the Lord has said through this angel, and she trusts that he is able to do that which is impossible. It's a good question for us to think about at Christmas. Do we have Mary's faith in God? Do we, do we believe that God can do the impossible with Mary? Do we believe that he's still able to do the impossible with us? What do we know about Mary? Well, we know, one thing we know is Mary's believing response enabled her to experience the grace of God to be used by God. 
You see, she was an ordinary woman with an extraordinary God. But what about this idea of joy? Well, as I said, these verses serve as a backdrop of sorts to reveal the joy that we find in three people in this story here. Mary and Elizabeth and her baby. Listen to verses 41 through 45. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth, Elizabeth's child leaped within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you abo above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believe that the Lord would do what he said. You are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do as he said. Briefly, I just want to consider the three characters in this paragraph. First, the joy that we find in Elizabeth. You see, we're told when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, she was filled with the Holy Spirit and that she was told what, why Mary had come. If we look through the passage, we see this word blessed kind of repeated here. And we find, and I apologize, the uh, passage I had before there, again, when you, when you get passages, they use words that are unfortunate. Um, the, the, the version that I quoted there, I think, used an unfortunate uh, translation there of saying that Mary was blessed above women. The proper word should be among women. Um, because Mary was simply a woman being used by God. It isn't to minimize who she was but it was to maximize who her God was. You see, this isn't a story of how great of a woman Mary was, but how great of a God we have who, who used Mary to allow Jesus to be born. Mary was blessed because she believed in God and his word. Elizabeth's joy, though, was from the Lord or was because of how the Lord had promised to use Mary to bring the Messiah. You see, it's a joy that's based in how the Lord is using another. It's a joy that we can share too in seeing how God is using others in our lives or in the lives of others. We can rejoice in seeing how he is using them. The second joy that we have is the joy of the unborn son, John. We see that in verses 41 and 44. This is probably the time when earlier on the promise that was given to Zechariah of how the Spirit um, would fill John in Luke 1.15. You see, even before his birth, John was able to rejoice in how and what God was going to do through the Messiah. We can't quite imagine that. But as we go and look to John's life and seeing how God uses John the Baptist and how he uses him to prepare the way, how he had the privilege and joy of introducing Christ to many, we begin to see how this joy of this child was in the announcement of the Lord's timing. That the Lord is coming. In a similar way, we can rejoice in the announcements of the Lord's coming in anticipation of that. The third one, of course, would be Mary. And Mary, in verses 46 through 56, which I'm not going to read for you, you can read that on your own, is Mary's song of joy, song of praise. It's here she expresses the joy as she lifts up her voice in a hymn, if you will, of praise. The fullness of the Spirit should lead us to such joyful praise. In her song, we see a weaving of Old Testament passages. We see from the Psalms, we see the song of Hannah from uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2. 
Mary hid God's word in her heart, and she turns this to song. We see that as the, or as the shepherds come and tell um, the, what they had heard from the angels, that Mary hides these things in her heart. We know from the text that Mary stays here with Elizabeth until John was born and then she returns to Nazareth. At the timing of her return to Nazareth, she is now about three months pregnant and it had become clear that, that something wasn't right. It's during this time here that this, the angel appears to Joseph as well to announce Mary and how she is pregnant. All of these things though, bring us to this question of the joy, the song of praise that Mary sings. It's a song of praise of how we can have and know and walk in joy even when it seems to be difficult. That's the hardest one, isn't it? When things aren't going well, it's hard to find joy, but that's where joy is needed. When things are going easy, it's a little bit different. But in Mary, I think we find how joy equals a trust for God. I am the Lord's servant. May it be, as Mary said. Seeing how the hand of God is working in us, working around us, is a source of all of our joy. Joy isn't limited or guided by happy moments, but it's simply found in rejoicing in how God is at work. There is nothing, nothing in the circumstances that the angel told Mary that should bring about joy. And yet, there was great reason for joy in seeing how God was going to use her. Isn't that how it works for us too? Isn't it seeing how God is work? are in us and around us that should cause us to joy? Can we rejoice in the same ways that Elizabeth and John and Mary found joy? Can we not rejoice when we see how God is working in the lives of others? Can we not rejoice in seeing how the Lord is at work in our world? Can we not rejoice when we see how the Lord is using us even in the midst of trying circumstances. There's a lot we can learn in the story of Luke 1. Not just about Mary, but hopefully for us as well. Because it's helpful for us to get beyond just the facts here, to see what these meant to the people of that day and what they mean for us as well so that our joy at Christmas may be full, that we may give the Lord thanks for what we see, for what we know, for what we are experiencing. Because there is great news, good news of great joy. The good news of great joy for all people is shocking news that we dare not get used to. Let me pray for us. Lord, I pray this morning that as we consider the words that we have read, that we may see the, the splendor of these words, that we may rejoice in what they mean. We give you thanks for the vision that you give us through the lives of people like Mary, to see, to see the joy in the midst of shocking news. May we rejoice in the joy that is spoken of here. May we walk in such joy as well, Lord. Amen.